So tonight's Saturday Night Mystery is this. How can a neo-noir movie in the early 80s starring two alumni of The Godfather and it was a very good movie not get any love from the critics or the award groups despite the fact that uh, De Niro and Duval were the two main actors? Well, let's confess for a second. There's got to be the movie True Confessions. This is the first time you're hearing about this movie. It hasn't been publicized that much, but it was so well respected when he did a DVD retrospective of De Niro's career. This was on the DVD set. Now, True Confessions is a new noir. <coughs> came out in 81, uh, directed by Ulu Grosbard and starring De Niro and Duval as her brother uh, Spellacy, a priest and police detective. Produced by Shardoff Winkler Productions, it is adapted from the novel of the same name by John Gregory Dunn, loosely based on the infamous Black Dahlia murder case of 47. Dunn wrote the screenplay's wife, novelist Joan Didion. The film was released on September 25, 81, receiving generally positive reviews from critics, but with the Midland uh, box office. At about two hours, is pretty well your perfect Saturday afternoon uh, or Sunday afternoon, uh, what he called, mystery movie. In this one, in 1948, Reverend uh, Desmond Spellacy is a young and ambitious Roman Catholic monk senior in the L.A. Archdiocese. His older brother, Tom, hmm, Tom, Tom Hagen, Robert Duval, is a hard-working homicide, homicide detective with the LAPD. They are fond of each other, but spend little time together. Des is the pride and joy of agent Cardinal uh, Danaher because of his skill at developing church projects <coughs> while keeping down costs. He cuts a corner now and then, overlooking the shady side of construction mogul Jack Amsterdam. A late Catholic who uses his ties to Monsignor for the congregation's benefit, but mainly for his own. Now, one day in L.A., a young woman is found brutally murdered, her body, body cut, in, cut in two in a very vacant lot. Tom and his partner Frank are put in charge of the case. The woman, Louis, uh, Louis Fazenda, is labeled a virgin tramp by the local press for apparently being a Catholic as well as a prostitute turning it into a sensational case. Now, Tom's investigation leads him to a local madam, Brenda Samuels. Tom was well acquainted with Brenda years earlier while working as a bagman for Amsterdam, whose corruption extends to the local prostitution ring. Now, Brenda's called the police to report the death of a Catholic priest while he was having sex with one of her prostitutes. While there, Brenda reproaches Tom for doing nothing for her while she was sent to prison for running one of Jack's whorehouses. Tom later believes a dead girl appeared in a stag film and obtains a copy. He and Frank notice that one of the girls in the movie was present at Brenda's brothel on the day he came to retrieve the philandering priest. Now, Tom now wants Brenda's help in tracking down the girl who made the movie with the murdered girl. Frank spots the girl a few days later being taken into jail entrance after a roundup. He learned that the dead girl was a favorite of the local porno movie director named Standard because of her tattoo. Tom learns that Standard is filming in a deserted army post in the foothills outside L.A. Now, at lunch with his brother, Tom provokes Amsterdam with secret facts about his dark side, which makes the Monsignor increasingly uncomfortable. Dez tells the Cardinal that the time has come to cut church ties with Amsterdam for good. Dez, Dez discovers getting rid of Jack with his cronies who remind him that such a thing would not be easily done. Sonny, a corrupt local city council member and local mortician, you got to double over this business, proposed that they give Jack a salutation dinner. Now, Tom's anger builds as his brother organizes a Catholic, Catholic layman of the year banquet for Amsterdam as a gesture of appreciation before ending the church relationship with him. Tom walks up to Amsterdam at the banquet and pulls off his sash while asking him loudly, were you wearing this when you were banging Lois Vizenda? Jack attacks Tom and he screams obscenities at each other. Now, Tom goes to Sanders' studio and finds the floor in a bathtub covered with dried blood. He also finds Chinese food, which a medical examiner doing the autopsy had found in a dead woman's stomach. Tom and Frank go looking for Standard, but learn that he'd been killed in a car accident 12 hours after the murder. Now, Tom wants to drag in Amsterdam for uh, questioning simply the humiliation of the public, but Frank talks him out of it. Tom starts digging around and discovers that the dead girl had been having sex with numerous community leaders. Now, Amsterdam's lawyer, Dan Campion, suddenly warns the Monsignor that his brother, the cop, had better lay off unless he wanted to reveal publicly that Des, too, knew the murdered girl. She met the Monsignor only once in passing, whereas she had a sexual relationship with both Amsterdam and the lawyer. But the simple fact that Des had any kind of involvement in such a murder case 
could permanently stain his reputation within the church. Now, Tom won't be talked out of it. His determination becomes complete when Brenda is found dead and appearing suicide. He decides to have Amsterdam picked up and taken to headquarters, which in turn leads to the Monsignor being treated the same way. His rising career curtail, Des asks to be relocated to a remote parish in the desert, the same place to which his mentor in the diocese had been exiled, the location where the movie begins and ends, where Des and Tom meet after years apart. By the time Tom comes to see him, Des is dying. Tom feels everything is his fault, but Des is at peace and absolves his brother of any and all blame. So we have a case here of a neo-noir where two male leads are involved rather than one against a uh, determined girl. So uh, maybe that's why he didn't uh, do that well in the box office. But I think the roles would have been reversed. Naval would have been the better priest because Naval was a very spiritual type actor and, uh, you know, the apostle in that famous movie. Now, besides uh, De Niro and Duval as Tom and Dez, uh, Charles Durning plays Amsterdam, Cyril Cusack as Cardinal uh, Deher, Burgess Meredith plays Monsignor Seamus Fargo, great name, by the way. Kenny McMillan is the stay to take the Frank Roddy with uh, Ed Flanders, Dan Hedia, Jeanette Nolan, and Missy Cleveland, and Tom Hill in major uh, major roles. Now, the character of Monsignor Spellacy is thought to be based on Monsignor Benjamin Hawks, who oversaw, oversaw growth of the Archdiocese of L.A. from the 1950s in the 1980s. And he would appear occasionally on television uh, doing blessings or special appearances. Now, De Niro prepared for a role of Monsignor by observing Monsignor Hawks as he said Mass. Conductor Paul Salamovich, who was choir director of Hawks Church Choir at St. Basil's uh, or Basil's Parish at the time, was brought in to coach De Niro on the sung Latin responses of the Mass and to conduct choral Ebbelet segments for the film. Now, producers Erwin Winkler and Robert Chardoff acquired the rights to Dunn's 77 novel in April 78. By October of that year, Dunn and his wife, screenwriter Didion, had completed a script, and Paul Schrader was originally intended to revise the screenplay and direct. However, Didion ultimately rewrote the script, and Ulo Grosbard was hired as director. When he was hired, De Niro had just two weeks to drop as much weight as possible that he had put on for Raging Bull. Now, filming took place around L.A. in 79, including at Echo Park, Union Station, and Al Vimo High School. Production went uh, over schedule, forcing original composer Bill Conti to drop out. This movie took 105 days to shoot, but was completed in mid-May 1980 near Lancaster, California. So if there was hope for a third Godfather movie, <laughs> you were pretty well caught on this. Now, when the film was released in the States on September 25th, 81, it was originally scheduled to release sometime in 1880, and then in February 81 before settling on a September date. Now, we were hearing that this was a bomb. It's not, it wasn't a bomb. It just basically, at the time, there was more things going on with De Niro and Duvall's uh, career that would have drawn more interest to those projects than this. Now, it was only released on DVD in April 2007 as a Region 1 widescreen by 20th Century. Uh, this was part, again, of the Robert De Niro seven-movie collection with True Confessions as a seven-disc of the set and the Blu-ray in 2014. Now, when it opened in four theaters, it made 154000 its opening weekend. It then expanded to 417 theaters in its fourth weekend of release, making $1.5 million, and peaked at 458 theaters in its sixth weekend when it made $1 million. It went on to gross $12.9 million at the box office at about a budget of $10 million. Very few places on the Atlantic coast of Canada were showing this movie because this was the time of Empire Strikes Back, uh, you know, Indiana Jones, and wasn't really big on our radar. Now, in review aggregate uh, Rotten Tomatoes, <coughs> the film holds a, a response rating of 69% based on 16 reviews, with an average rating of 8.1 out of 10. Metacritic uh, gives it 668 out of 100 based on 12 critics, which means uh, generally favorable reviews. Now, the reviews were kind of mixed, especially by a certain right-wing critic. Now, New York Times critic Vincent Canby declared the film a reminder just how good commercial American movies can be when the right people come together. Now, Roger Ebert, Chicago Sun-Times, did a positive review, uh, which you can see on YouTube. He gave the film three out of four. He wrote that while the performances were good and some individual scenes very well crafted, the movie as a whole was disappointing. 
uh, as the atten atten attentions of the filmmakers were concentrated so fiercely in individual moments that nobody ever stood back to ask what the story was about. It's frustrating to sit through a movie filled with clues and leads and motivations, only to discover at the end that the filmmakers can't be bothered with finishing the story. Now, William F. Buckley, uh, you know how much he... he uh, He's a, a good movie critic, but I'll give you a, a, what he said. He had praised the original novel, but uh, however, in his review of the film, in his natural review, Buckley complained that Robert De Niro is badly miscast. He is never entirely convincing. Well, he's not a Protestant, so what else is he going to play? Uh, De Niro, if the, De Niro got Protestant in him. But De Niro would do uh, occasional, like, spiritually based uh, movies through the years. Now, I did see half an hour of this uh, at a TCM TCM channel years ago. I think it was like a Duval tribute evening or whatever. I just found it was a little bit TV-ish. It would have made a good TV movie. But the big screen, I mean, you're you're dealing with tropes of, of LA Confidential, of l literally the, the that case. That case is quite interesting. Why was that woman cut in half? We still don't know. Like the whole movie kind of bears it out. Was it a kink? Was it a retaliation against people that were running prostitutes? Why specifically that? And what did he cut him in half with? Like, would you cut a body in half on, unless you got some really good hands, you're going to have to, you know, um, if you got a laser in Star Trek, you can cut a body in half. But like I said, it is what it is. So ladies and gentlemen, true confessions. I can't uh, rate the movie for you because I haven't seen it all the way through. One of these days I will. But if you, uh, if you like the movie, tell me what you liked about it. I think getting to Durning and De Niro and Duval, the three Ds, as I call them in the same movie, uh, it was wasted a little bit because Charles Durning, if you give him enough, he can play a strong villain. And, uh, you know, he got the Academy Award nominations to prove it. To prove it. And I always like seeing uh, a good character actor like Jeanette Nolan in movies like this. It gives, it gives us a better indication of her diverse talent. She can play anything. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what we're doing here, we're Robert Duvall and Robert De Niro uh, recaps of their career. Let us know with a like, comment, subscribe, or share. And don't forget, request to the channel. I always appreciate it and always highly considered. But personally, ladies and gentlemen, I think Duvall is just a little bit better than De Niro as an actor because Duvall has played a whole bunch of uh, diverse parts. De Niro, sometimes, he can play the family drama, but Duvall can, so... Like a, one can play nine parts, but De Niro can only play eight. And has De Niro ever done an action, science fiction action movie to the level of uh, Duval? You know, would De Niro be as good in falling down as Duval was? You know what I'm saying? He Duval was sometimes a supporting character, but he was still dominant. Every time he came on the screen, it made uh, made it better. With De Niro, you don't know what he's going to do. Sometimes he's good, and sometimes he's hey, you know, a little bit, a little bit. Thanks for listening. Bye.